and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and in this episode, we'll be discussing why progressives should reject the concept of universal basic income, or UBI, as it is presently proposed. UBI has come into popularity recently due to the presidential campaign of Andrew Yang. And the concept is that every American should be able to share in the prosperity of our automated future through a monthly dividend of $1,000 per month. The argument Yang makes is that $1,000 a month would change a lot of people's lives. And, and you know what, he's not wrong. But the way the policy is being proposed by Yang and others leaves much to be desired. I originally posted this short essay in January of 2019, um, and it quickly became one of the most popular writings uh, I've written with over 1,300 people reading the article. Um, For this episode, I'm going to uh, make my original argument and then expand upon it, citing present-day examples to help further strengthen my initial points, while also addressing some of the critics of the argument I've made. Uh, It's my belief that progressives can do much better than UBI, and I hope to convince you of that as well. Thanks again for tuning into the Thinking Progressive podcast. Universal basic income is gaining popularity in America as the next logical economic step in a post-automation world. Touted as the way to save America's capitalism, it ensures that people have enough money to keep consuming while raising the quality of life for our most impoverished. UBI boasts some attractive benefits for the majority of Americans, but is it worth the cost? I argue that given the present ideologies driving UBI, Implementing the policy will do more harm than good. Universal basic income is a form of social protection that provides an amount of money to every citizen within a population. Money transfers occur periodically and without condition. The premise is that this method of wealth redistribution will alleviate many of the economic burdens facing so many American families. There have been numerous studies on the impacts of cash transfer programs that have shown positive results. Uh, In 2007, a program by New York City Center for Economic Opportunity demonstrated that small cash stipends reduced poverty and material hardship for recipients, but saw those impacts decrease once the money was rescinded. So once they took the money back, the positive impacts went away. The World Bank reports that it's a myth that our poorest squander wealth transfers on wasteful activities such as increased alcohol and cigarette consumption. These studies and more are pushing UBI from a fantastical idea into a legitimate policy discussion. Visionaries like Martin Luther King Jr., Bernie Sanders, Barack Obama, and Elon Musk have all vocalized support for UBI given the trending automation that will redefine labor as we know it. Uh, Presidential candidate Andrew Yang is making UBI a significant focus of his campaign, saying, and I quote, UBI is necessary for the continuation of capitalism through the automation wave and the displacement of workers. But how do we even begin to structure an argument against a program that demonstrates positive, data-driven results and is supported by some of the greatest minds of past and present? Well, it all starts with why. The purpose of all proposals of universal basic income is to increase the access and agency of every individual operating within the capitalist system. The core argument is as the nature of work continues to change, so will the necessity for higher levels of economic distribution, typically funded by a new taxation model such as the value-added tax. Now, UBI is in many respects a recognition of a new human right, a fundamental requirement for every individual to function within our world today. But here we identify the problem with UBI as it exists presently. Is universal basic income a human right? Or is it an attempt to attenuate the inequalities created by capitalism? If we believe universal basic income is a human right, then we should be approaching the implementation in the form of a constitutional arrangement, not economic policy. We would want to ensure that a standard of living is codified into our most sacred laws, preventing present and future politicians from meddling with the ideal. Funding could occur from a variety of sources, but each solution would ensure that decisions regarding the implementation and collection of those funds would be in the hands of society. 
universal basic income as a human right would lend itself to the restructuring of prison arrangements. But this is not what is being suggested by most proponents today. If universal basic income is a means to address inequity created by current structure, then it does nothing to create agency for its recipients. A UBI funded by tax and transfer would calcify poverty and class structure within the United States even more than our present arrangements. Accepting that the solution to the hyper-concentration of wealth is a small stipend for the masses is a choice to perpetuate class structure and division. Remember that universal basic income is being proposed as a solution to the future impact automation will have on labor. It does nothing to address the ownership of said automation, only focusing on ensuring that the vast majority receive a relatively minor kickback. It's also important to note that as argued by Andrew Yang himself on the, a podcast recently with Eric Weinstein called The Portal, um, universal basic income would be a substitute for other government programs. So for example, welfare or food stamps. His argument is that those programs have a lot of uh, conditions. They have a lot of stipulations, so they're difficult to get. They're mentally stressful. So this is kind of a, a no cost, no hassle dividend. But if you're receiving this dividend, it takes away from those other social programs you're receiving. So what are we actually doing for people who are very low income? We're not doing anything any different than we were before. We're giving them $1,000, so it might be a little bit more convenient for them, but their net worth is not increasing. Uh, who this is increasing the net worth of is middle class and wealthy American. So it does nothing to help the people that it is intended to help the most. A universal basic income focused on economics is a system that appeases the individual by providing just enough to survive while denying them the opportunity to transform their situation in a meaningful way. As progressives, when we think about the transformation of individual agency through a suite of social protections, we must ask ourselves if our actions are complementing structural change or merely substituting one inferior arrangement for another. Exploring implementing an entitlement like UBI must begin with the question of what direction is this leading us? We understand the most popular and dominant ideas in society today do more to reinforce existing arrangements than they do to support institutional reformation. And when we frame UBI as a savior to our present form of single market capitalism, we unwittingly submit to the past dominance of the present. If UBI is not accompanied by structural alternatives to codify the raising of the human condition, then we must see it for what it is, more of the same under a different name. As someone who supports a suite of vital protections for every person, it seems counterintuitive to argue against a wealth redistribution model that would generate immediate benefits for so many. But if our shared objective is raising the human condition, then we cannot settle for economic policies that would appease the burden of a structure that places 99% of the wealth and power in the hands of 1% of the population. Together, we must reject belittlement under the guise of support focusing instead on the rearranging of institutions that generate the very inequities we seek to address. Now, bringing this to present day, Bernie Sanders recently released a plan to change the corporate structure of America, essentially entitling uh, the employees of large corporations, I believe over $100 million, uh, to have ownership stakes in those companies. Essentially, uh, stocks would be set aside every year to a, st to a, a collective account owned by the workers up to 20%. Uh, companies couldn't be sold unless the workers uh, had a say in that vote. Uh, and, and this is a, you know, a real structural reformation of the way corporations work. And I think you know, when we contrast a plan like Bernie's uh, corporation plan to Andrew Yang's universal basic income, we start to see where UBI, as it's proposed today, is just a, a pacifying of capitalist institutions as they are. You know, Automation po does pose a very real threat. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, but automation can, without a doubt, be one of the best things that's ever happened to humanity. In fact, I think it will be one of the best things. Um, but only if we rearrange the institutions of society to support the majority through that automation. As mentioned earlier, Andrew Yang's plan essentially just calcifies more power in the owners of the machines and automation by pacifying the poor majority. 
Uh, and that's just not enough. We need genuine structural reform. Now, let me make some clarifying statements because I'm not talking about the premise of universal basic income as it may be, or as it could be, or maybe even as it should be, but rather how it is. You know, we can only argue policy in the present tense. Uh, the future is unknown, right? And the past is, is, is not relevant at this point. Um, but here we are in the now. So you know, critics who might say, well, listen, UBI uh, taking place of, for example, labor, uh, that would create tremendous opportunities. And, and yes, you're right. But $1,000 a month uh, is not going to replace labor for anyone in America. Um, in fact, it, it probably won't bring certain people even out of poverty. It might help them a bit. So we're not talking about the best possible definition of UBI as it stands. We're talking about UBI in the present. What is being proposed by candidates at this moment? Which is why, again, progressives should reject the concept because we're not you know, arguing for the ideal. We're arguing against the present. Uh, and, and what is proposed now is, is just not up to snuff in terms of what we need for true systemic reformation. Now, some people might argue that automation is far away. Um, there is a lot of time coming. We don't need a post-automation solution today. Uh, and they're both right and wrong. They, they are incorrect that it is a long time coming. Um, technology is growing exponentially. The processing power in relation to cost and size uh, it has been a trend for quite some time. Uh, Moore's law consistently becomes surpassed as it reaches its limits. So automation is going to be here sooner than we believe. And that's something we, we need to really think about. And I, I think you know, a future version of UBI, one that truly gives ownership, again, like Sanders kind of corporate structure plan where the employees uh, have a share, have dividends from the success of the company. Uh, I think that is uh, in, in that scenario where we can truly have uh, companies that essentially automate the vast majority of work, the routine work. Because when we think of automation, um, something to consider when we, we talk about this is anything that can be repeated can be written into a formula. And anything formulaic can be coded into software and, and or a machine. And that machine can repeat the routine, leaving human beings for the creative work, right? That's the one thing that machines are, are unlikely to ever be able to surpass us in. Possibly AI, depending on who you talk to. There's a lot of experts with a lot of different opinions. Um, but I personally believe that AI may never match our truly innovative and infinite creative potential. That is kind of the human condition to be able to create in this um, you know, recursive infinity. There's just no way uh, that there's a cap on that. Um, and that's the kind of work we want to you know, put ourselves into. Of course, routine work is fine when we want to do it, but we want to ensure people have the ability to switch from the routine and creative work back and forth. And that's why UBI that's proposed today does, does nothing to do that. Perhaps in a future of a totally automated world um, and higher degree of social dividends, then I would support it. Um, but again, as it is now, progressives should reject this plan. Another thing to consider with UBI is that it may increase inflationary pressure pretty significantly. And that would, without a doubt, negate the benefits of our poorest. Uh, and, and really going beyond that, create really additional harm for people who might be, for example, disabled or uh, have mental disabilities. Um, they would be harmed because we'd remove those social safety nets, right? Sacrifice for UBI. So once that benefit drops below, for example, what it might take to live, even the working poor will be back you know, under the control of employers. So it's important to think long-term about this. Any program that we implement that sacrifices other programs is by nature contradictory towards the progressive movement of increasing access and agency for every human being within our society. So if not UBI, then what? Well, an alternative vision would be laying the framework for a more robust suite of protections to increase individual agency. So what does that framework look like? Well, it looks like a, a more vital suite of protections. Um, for example, you would begin with working towards codifying rights to food and water, shelter, healthcare, education, transportation, information, and communication, all of which are vitally important in the present day. Uh, you would also rearrange the laws of property and contracts within our economic structure to allow multiple different types of markets to exist simultaneously. Compare that today to our singular form of capitalism where everything kind of falls under the same guise, 
uh, the similar rules of property and contract. Uh, so medicine is being judged by the same rules as video games. Uh, it's just, you're disparate. Essentially, at the end of the day, we need to raise the floor dramatically while making the middle much more competitive and opening up you know, access to advanced forms of credit in the form of technology, practice, procedure, and even capital. And making the top, at the very top, this is kind of where we get into the UBI being a possible good thing, the top then becomes more socialized. So it's kind of like a, I call it a veggie burger market, right? Highly socialized bottom, even more competitive middle with more freedom for the actors within it, and then a, a socialized top. And companies become institutionalized, uh, integrated into society, then, then become part of society. And while we're on the, the, the notion of rearranging institutions of society and a minimum basic income, there also begs the discussion for a maximum income, which I'm not going to go too into today, uh, but it's something we should really consider. There's a lot of talk lately about billionaires. Do billionaires add value to society? Uh, my argument is a strong no. Uh, it creates many kings who usually in many cases, as you can see from just public comments, let that power and uh, wealth go to their head and believe that they have some sort of divinity beyond the average human being, which we should never forget that they are just human beings who've had a lot of circumstances go correct and go in their favor. Uh, and, and there's no doubt that many of them are brilliant and have accomplished great things, uh, but it doesn't give them any more right or say in the direction of our national future uh, than the poorest individual in our society. Uh, that's not what a democracy is about, and that's not what progressives believe. We believe in one voice and one vote, equal representation within our democracy. So that concludes this week's episode of the Thinking Progressive podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Ron Rivers. Thank you so much for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and like this episode. If you really liked it, please take a moment to share this episode through your social media channels with your friends and family. At the end of the day, the more people we can get talking about the progressive movement, the more voices we have involved in thinking deeply about the issues that face us, uh, the better our movement will be and the quicker we can recognize our truly transformative potential. Thanks again. I'll see you next week.